Sea snakes are real, air-breathing snakes with body scales and forked tongue, so well adapted to an aquatic life. Many are highly venomous, the venom of some more potent than a cobra, and yet they are the least known of all reptiles. Here in the crystal clear waters of the Coral Sea, we meet and study at close quarters the sea snakes of Marion Reef. On board Freedom 2, undersea filmmaker Ben Kropp leads this expedition. Dr. Glenn Burns obtained his doctorate on his study of sea snakes. Ben drops in on the wreck of the Yongala, a known sea snake habitat. Here it comes. Lots and lots of fish. Wow, look at those fish on the surface there too. Ah, right above it. Okay, marker boy. Lynn Roberts and Sharon Harris are diving crew members along with Ben's son, Dean. The Yongala sank in a cyclone in 1911 with the loss of 137 lives. Her rusting tomb is now festooned with colourful soft corals and swarms of fish. One species of sea snakes is prevalent, Apisaurus laevis, the olive sea snake. It's large, venomous and thankfully docile and less provoked. We spent many, many hours down on the Ongala. Such a magnificent wreck, absolutely festooned with soft corals, swarming with fish. And in all those hours down there, I happened to run across something special. And this was a hawksbill turtle eating some of the soft coral. Its head was actually stuck right in the, amongst all the soft corals, and I had quite a difficulty getting the camera around to see what it was actually eating. Well, eventually, I got in and saw that it was eating a spongy type of soft coral, which was attached to the wreck. Australia has 37 species of sea snakes. The largest grows to three and a half metres. The olive here can measure two metres. On their way out to Marion Reef in the Coral Sea, there's a surprise meeting with some ocean giants. Wiles up ahead. They're humpback whales returning to Antarctica. It's fully neutral and hopefully the whales will come up to us. Do you want to have a look? Wow, there's quite a few of them. Yeah, a whole bunch. Like this one, two, three, four. There's heaps more still. Probably five or six. They look like they're in a real hurry though. They're powering along, aren't they? Wow, there's a snake. Hey, over there next to that whale. Lynn, see the snake? Oh, look, God. the whale's turning around. coming up beside it. It's right on its nose. It looks like it's playing with it. It's too. That's amazing. It's like real. It's just balanced it on top of its head. I there it goes. The snake's taken off now. I don't, I don't think you like that. <laughs> 
Marion Reef is 200 nautical miles offshore, an exotic home to the sea snakes. There's two turtles mating out there. Wow. The team plan to study the sea snakes' foraging and feeding patterns and their behaviour towards man, a matter of considerable personal interest to the divers. Now I know you haven't spent a lot of time in the water with sea snakes and they will approach, all right, they will get approached. We're bound to see some olives out here somewhere and if an olive snake sees you, it will come and approach you. Um, but don't worry, don't panic. I mean, they're not going to bite you. They're not going to try and mate with you, all right? <laughs> So just hang still in the water, try and relax. If they come and investigate you, just let them investigate. Uh -huh. They might hang around for a minute or two, then they'll leave. Marion Reef and its sand caves are jewels in a rainbow sea. The underwater visibility is extraordinary, more than 50 metres. But this wonderland has proved treacherous to some. The surf has broken the ship in two and pounded her to pieces. Still, wreck divers always hope to discover something interesting. Sea snakes are easy to capture if you are quiet and careful. The venom of some is on a par with the cobra, the king brown and the death adder. This is an interesting find. Hey guys, I found a sea chest. It's just over here. It's locked. It's a big, big metal box. Wonder what's in it. can send imaginations running wild. But what Dean pulls out is certainly not treasure. So what did you find? Oh, it's full of detonators. All those green wires are all detonators. So it's probably full of gelignite as well. I'll be hammering away at it with that thing. <laughs> it's a crowbar. Oh, no. So I'm not going to touch it anymore. Good idea. <laughs> Hydrophus sornatus is well named. It's one of the most colourful of snakes. Glenn makes snake catching look so easy, but there is a skill and timing to the procedure and an inherent danger if the snake objects. Hydrophus elegans is also beautifully patterned and dangerous. The flattened paddle-shaped tail enhances its propulsive thrust. Twin nostrils set on top of the head are equipped with flaps to keep them closed under water. Gentle touch, and Elegans does not resist going into the catch bag. A tropical storm is brewing. Ben is concerned. There is little protection out here from a southwesterly blow. While they ride the storm out, the rising swell plays havoc with the nesting birds.
Sharks always circle the quay and the surge is washing the chicks seawards to where the sharks patrol. As the storm abates, the team prepare to scuba dive on a coral pinnacle that rises 30 metres from the lagoon floor. The colours are magnificent. The visibility seems endless. A smaller fish population gives it an empty look. A sense of ocean and remoteness from the realm of man. This coral garden, this Eden, has its own variety of serpents. highly venomous, except just one. The turtle-headed sea snake are basically harmless, but it's very difficult to identify sometimes because they come in such a variety of colours and patterns. Certainly some we saw look almost identical to a small olive sea snake. Small olives are potentially lethal. Mitocephalus is harmless. The only way to tell the difference between the two is uh, the pattern of scales on the head, but of course to see that you've got to have your face within 25 centimetres of the snake and so it's probably not recommended for most divers. Being a sea snake expert, Glenn easily recognises this harmless snake. Most divers cannot. Sharon is not convinced. Sea snakes shed their skin every few weeks. It rids the snake of marine growth that slows them down, like on the hull of a ship. The threat of a venomous sea snake is dependent on its aggressiveness, the length of its fangs, the toxicity of its venom, and the dosage delivered. A good dose can kill, and many fishermen in Southeast Asia do die each year, even though there is an anti-venom available. Quite often these snakes, especially the olive sea snakes, will follow divers. They seem to be attracted to the movement of a diver's fins. Now, of course, when this happens, if a sea snake approaches a diver because it's attracted to the movement of their fins, quite often the first thing the diver does is kick at the sea snake. And if they're provoked, these olive sea snakes will attack. And if they do attack, the attack can be savage and relentless. These snakes have actually chased divers out of the water. Now in the old days when we went and caught snakes, we used a running noose or even a special snake catcher tongs. And the snakes didn't like that either. Now when we released them, you had a pretty cranky snake on your hands. Often he'd turn around and attack the diver and then foolishly in those days our reaction, our method of defence was to kick the snake away and that only aggroed it more. And there you can see a snake that's been released repeatedly attacking the diver. Back it comes, it's kicked away, back it comes again and again and again. And that snake, if it got past the flippers, I'm sure would bite. And, and the diver himself is going through a pretty hard time.
Now we've learned since those days that the best way is simply to freeze and let it come right at you. Even the turtle-headed sea snake, the Mitocephalus, will follow divers. We had them follow us around for an hour. One followed us for an entire dive. Swimming amongst their fins wouldn't leave us alone. There's no reason why a Mitocephalus would follow a diver, except for curiosity. They obviously don't think of us as a potential mate. We're not any sort of food source. It just basically seems to be a curious nature. When you spend a long time underwater observing and filming sea snakes, you're bound to come across something special, something, well, new, unique that hadn't been filmed before. And this was so when I approached this turtle-headed snake and saw that it was eating what appeared to be algae. It was actually quite vigorously eating and tugging at the algae. And I assume uh, that there's eggs in that algae and that's what it's eating because it is an egg-eating snake. So just to be sure, Glenn takes a sample of the algae and he'll take it back to the lab to determine later whether uh, there are eggs in there or whether we've got a, a, a different diet of this snake, algae itself. I just want you to have a look at the similarities there. Now, if you saw this thing swimming around on the bottom, there's really no way you'd be able to tell the difference. Okay, yeah, there's not Re much difference. No, at all. really, the only way you can tell the only diff the major differences are in the head. All right. I'm just I'll see if I can hold his head still. All right. Now, basically, what you're looking at again is those pattern of scales on top yep. of the head, and this one has got one big long scale along the top of the jaw there. Oh yeah. So the, the point I'm making is that you really can't tell the difference unless you get that close to them. So although this one's harmless and this one's dangerous, right? I mean, the idea is you just treat them all as dangerous because unless you know what to look for, you really can't tell. Their diet is mainly sedentary fish, those that live in burrows or hide in crevices. Gobies and small coral fish are their favorite food. The snake cannot catch them out in the open. It must trap them in the coral. This may happen only once a week a rare event never witnessed or filmed. Thanks, mate. There you go. Good luck. The net catches fresh wrasse. Glenn wants to study the snake's feeding behavior by hand feeding them. Olive sea snakes are quite easy to feed underneath the water. Naturally, they're a generalist feeder. They feed on quite a wide variety of different prey species. And when we go down to feed them, uh, just about any small fresh fish is acceptable food for the olive sea snakes. Even a frozen bait fish, thaw it out, take it down, they'll take that. And the bite, when they, when they take the prey, the bite is very quick, quite hard. You can see them bear down on the prey, probably injecting venom. The, the swallow then is very quick. If the fish is small enough, a large olive can swallow one of these fish in just a few seconds. The ascent for air is slowed by the extra weight and the bulge you can see in its stomach. We saw that the snake first licked the fish from head to tail to determine if it was too large to swallow. The next hungry snake fails to do this test. We came across a small olive that was out foraging and I wanted to feed it but all I had was this one wrasse left. And the wrasse was a bit big but I thought well we'll see if this small olive is able to swallow a fish this size. The little snake gave it his best shot. He was obviously hungry. He really wanted to swallow that fish. He bit, worked his way to the head, and try as he could, he just couldn't get that fish down. He just couldn't quite get there. He really did give it his best shot. Their lung is huge, three quarters the length of their body. This 
together with a slow heart rate, allows them to dive to 100 meters and stay submerged for as long as two hours. Glenn is recording this snake's submersion time. On average, it proves to be about 10 minutes. While we are limited in our dives, sea snakes can add to their bottom time by breathing extra oxygen through their skin. This probably explains why they do not suffer the bends by passing excess nitrogen back out through the skin. Male sea snakes are blessed with two penises. The olive sea snakes have a seasonal reproductive cycle and the males actively go out and court females. And you'll see this mostly during the winter months. The males will swim across the top of a female, very sinuous sort of elegant motion. And then they'll take a wrap around the female. At that stage the female usually tries to, to get away. She'll dive off in amongst the coral and try and shake herself free from the embrace of the male. But if the male can hold on, then he'll bring his vent in contact with hers and evert his hemipenis into her body cavity. On the outside of the hemipenis are all these backward pointing hooks and spines. So that once it goes into the female and swells up, these backward pointing spines hold it in place. It's always fun to go fishing and have tuna on the menu. Oh, Gap Freddy. Oh, it looks like a yellow bit tuna. Next. Uh, they're walking around the back here. Sharks circling the sand cay in the hope of a seabird meal quickly come in for the tuna carcass. This big tawny shark is not dangerous like the smaller whalers. I'll catch him. Okay, go on. Watch the whalers. Out of here. Dean! 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 Come out! Come out! <laughs> Every day is another adventure. A new learning experience down in the crystal waters among the sea snakes of Marion Reef. Apisurus lavis, or the olive sea snake, is probably one of the most common snakes on the reef, and it's the one that most divers encounter when they're diving. They have relatively large fangs, quite large venom glands, and they are a potentially very dangerous snake. But when you're on the bottom with them, because they're not frightened of you, they don't get defensive, and so you can actually approach very closely. Mind you, you can actually provoke these snakes and divers have been chased by olive sea snakes. If an olive snake does approach you, the best thing you can do is just freeze in the water and uh, let them inspect you. They're not likely to bite unless they're provoked, but I mean, that's the question. What, what constitutes provocation? Certainly sometimes having a camera thrust in their face is, uh, is provocation enough. 
working with these olive sea snakes underwater is relatively safe. I always use bare hands because it's highly unlikely that you're going to get bitten while you're working with them underneath the water. You'll see quite often when you touch an olive sea snake, just touch them gently and they tend to stiffen up and then you're able to lift them gently out of the coral and it makes them very easy then to, to catch, to slip into a catch bag. So really there's no need to wear gloves when you're working with them underneath the water. How big was that olive? Oh, she is huge. That's a big old female. That's probably the biggest one we've seen. Oh, big and fat. But what huge a, head. Yeah, huge head. What a wonderful animal to work with because she was totally unafraid of us. I mean, how often do you get a chance to work with a big venomous animal like that? And you can get right up there, uh, right up next to her, watch her forage. She is totally unafraid of you. It's just great. Just a great animal. I love them. on deck, that's when you run the risk of being bitten. But even then I prefer to use bare hands. It gives me more control. I can feel the snake I'm moving in my fingers. Body for me. Look at the size of the head on her, will you? She's beautiful. This is a big old female. About how long? I don't know, we'll measure in a minute. We'll measure her wire and see. See if she wants to bite on this. Whoa! That was a massive dose of venom. What I'll get you to do now is we'll just have a look and see whether she can go through this wetsuit. I imagine she'll go through a wetsuit, like the sort of wetsuits we're using easily. Isn't that bit of soap in there? I'm just gonna... Working with these snakes in the water is actually pretty good, but working with them on deck here... Let her bite on that. Whoa! Oh, her whole body tenses yeah. up. Oh yeah. Whoa, there's two big fang marks. Two big fang marks there. So you can see that... Got through that wetsuit with heaps to spare. Easily. So my wetsuit really isn't any protection against snakes. No, not really. Not it's against too thin. It's too thin. Hey? <laughs> I'd, I'd have to wear two wetsuits then, wouldn't I? <laughs> Maybe that's the answer. Well, I can't believe that. That is all just venom. Because of the dangers in obtaining sea snake venom for medical research, it's worth far more than gold, $20 million for one kilogram of dried venom. Yep. Yep, all right. Snout vent, Lee. 101 snout vent. 101. 101? Yep. Yep, all right. Wonderful. All right. She's 1,500 grams, 1,500. One half kilos. Glenn always releases the snake in the same yeah, location it was captured. There she goes. Very little is known about the daily movements of a foraging snake. Ben nets some fresh fish to use in a tracking experiment. They will try at night to have a snake swallow a transmitter. So there's the little sonic tag and that emits clicks at 75 kilohertz. Um, so we'll be able to pick that up with the submersible hydrophone. So what we'll do now is we'll stick this in the fish, mm -hmm. take it down, try and feed it to a sea snake. We'll be able to track the snake around the reef. Excellent. Right, light on. A night dive is exhilarating. To enjoy it, one must forget about the sharks that may lurk in the darkness behind and concentrate on the wonders revealed by the lamp ahead. This is the time when sea snakes are more likely to feed. Sharp-eyed Glenn knows this is a harmless, turtle-headed snake.
four different snake species are seen on this dive, all are specialised feeders and may not like the fish Glen has to offer. Hydrophus elegans refuses the sonic bait. Glenn tries again with another snake. That Dubois that we tried to feed with quite a large ras, really wanted to swallow that ras and it just couldn't get it down. Try as hard as it did, it couldn't get it down. But you can see the jaws moving and you can see the way the skull is very flexible and they'll actually move their jaws forward along the fish trying to get it down and as they do their body obviously swells. And with Dubois sea snake, that exposes that um, pink skin between the black scales. Actually, a very pretty snake. The night dive was not successful. Glenn captures more fish and looks for a big olive in the daytime, one that can easily swallow the fish with the transmitter. This big female olive was obviously hungry. As soon as we put the bait in front of her, she took it. And that had the transmitter in it. So getting the transmitter inside her was very easy. She was very active. She came straight back. It seemed to be looking for more fish. So we gave her another one and she swallowed it almost instantly. Again she came back, still foraging, and so we fed her a third fish. And you could see, after she'd eaten that third fish, this huge bulge in her stomach. This olive is so full of fish it can barely rise for air. Time to track her. She's had six hours to rest and now they want to see if she's moved. Okay, Lynn. I might cut the motor so you can hear better. Yeah, I got her. I got her. She's over there. Just over here? Yeah. Yeah, she's somewhere over there on that bombing. Just about on that corner, I guess. She's very faint. No, there she is. I got her. Got much of a signal? Yeah, she's still here. Still here? Yeah, she's still here. I think the bomb is right underneath us, or it's just behind us. At the moment, she's just over there. Well, I reckon we'll probably call it a night, come back, see if she's still here in the morning, eh? Excellent. Good. You awake, Danny? You awake, Danny? Morning already. Let's see if she's still here. She's 
just moved. We'll head up over there. Try and go around that side of the bombing. Yeah, yeah, let's run down the river. Got a signal? Yep, she's here. Excellent. She's just there. Are they territorial? Like, is she, would she be territorial? They don't actually defend the territory. I mean, territoriality implies aggression, and you have snakes competing for food or mates, that kind of thing. And, and they don't do that. Um, but they, as you've seen, they don't move around much either. Mm. They're all living in these fairly small home ranges, but all these home ranges seem to overlap. Right? There's plenty of food around for them, obviously, plenty of home sites for them, obviously plenty of mates. Right? So there's no actual aggression between the individuals, and they all have this, they share this whole area. You can see even when she's out foraging, she might move 200 metres that way, 150 metres that way, come back across this way. She keeps sort of within that little area of, of scattered bombies. How many more days do you want to do this? How many more days do you want to track her? Oh, as long as we can, you know. I mean, uh, we'd like to do it for at least a week. It's only after that that we start to get some idea of her movements on a day-to-day -day basis, her, her normal home range. She's just here. I reckon we jump in and have a look. All right. Go and see what she's doing. Grab our gear. Cool. Might be hungry again. She might be. We'll see. Gwen's previous field work showed the female olive breeds every second year and produces only two or three young. She is ovoviviparous, meaning she produces eggs that hatch inside her body and the young are born alive, fully developed and able to fend for themselves. Her reproduction rate is low, but fortunately the juvenile survival rate is high. Oh, how'd you go? Good, good, good. She's moved again. Yeah. She's up here now, right? This is right. day four. That's where she was when we picked her off that first day. Mm -hmm. Right, and then she moved on that first day, basically, about only about 200 metres, hung there. Then she moved across to this section here. She spent about 24 hours just around those scattered little bombies right. there, and that's those ones over there. Right. Right, there's that big bomb in, and the, the smaller ones just to the south. And now here she's moved all back the way here. back. Yeah. So basically she's more or less moved back to where she was the other day. So basically she's only in about a 200 metre radius. At the moment she's just moved within that 200 metre radius. Yeah. yeah. Mythical sea serpents were a product of overwrought imagination and an occasional hoax. Real sea snakes, diminutive in comparison, hold their own aura of mystery. It's their occasional aggression to divers which gives them notoriety. I've become what you might call the paparazzi of the undersea world. To make this film, I've had to literally shove the camera into the faces of so many snakes. And some of them, they don't like it. You can see they react. They react away from the camera. Sometimes they'll rush into the camera. And especially I do have a little bit of trouble with Perinai and Jurassi, both of them very dangerous snakes. And each time I get that camera close, they just don't like it. And I guess you can't blame them for it. Apisurus Dubois-i, or Dubois sea snake, they seem to be very um, agitated, easily agitated. And we've also noticed that in, when they recoil back, they, they tense up and they blow bubbles from their nostrils and then they'll freeze. That's a good time for us to freeze too. We've found that um, they, they're very easily spooked. And certainly Ben's found that when you put a camera in their face, they will rush the camera occasionally. Not necessarily strike at the camera, they don't seem to open their mouths and bite. 
but definitely they rush and, uh, and, and will bump the camera. Duboisai also has the most potent venom of uh, any of the sea snakes that have been tested so far. The fangs of course are quite small and the venom glands are quite small so they don't produce uh, a very large amount of this venom but drop for drop it's the most toxic of any of the sea snake venoms. One of the other species that we were able to look at while we are out here on this trip was Acleptophus perinii, that's perin sea snake or what we came to call the horny headed sea snake because it has these uh, quite distinctive horny scales above its eyes. Don't often get a chance to watch perin sea snake but out there in one particular spot, open sandy bottom, we were able to watch four or six at a time all feeding. They seem to feed almost entirely on gobies from what we were able to observe. They put their head into the entrance of a goby burrow and then just sit there. They sit there and wait. They seem to be an ambush predator. Not actually getting down into the goby burrows to trap the goby in its burrow, but they'll sit with its head just inside the entrance to the burrow and then wait. And we've sat and waited with them. And sometimes they'll sit there for half an hour, completely immobile, waiting for that goby to re-emerge. We did actually see three times Acleptophus coming to the surface with gobies in their mouths. So it seems that once, they, once they're able to grab that goby, they'll come up to the surface and swallow it there, which is quite unusual. They're very defensive snakes. They're easily provoked too, we noticed. And when, when you disturb them on the bottom, the head immediately comes up one stage there. When Ben was following one with a camera, it turned and it rushed. It rushed straight back and hit the camera. Not necessarily trying to bite, but certainly that was a, a defensive bluff. Yep. Yep, she's here. Yeah, she's just over there. Excellent. She's actually moved quite a long way. Sea snakes do have predators. This olive has suffered a deep gash, probably caused by a shark or a large fish. It's been documented that tiger shark stomach contents regularly contain swallowed sea snakes. The giant groper too. Sea eagles pick them up when they surface to breathe. Fishermen in developing countries reduce the sea snake population by overfishing the snake's diet. Man-induced threats are the greatest. Australian prawn trawlers catch 120,000 sea snakes annually as bycatch. Some are released, others used to make leather. In Asia, they eat the meat as an aphrodisiac. With their greater contact with sea snakes, it's the fishermen who are mostly bitten. Wayne McEwen was such a victim. When I was working down, down south at Fraser Island at Mahimo Rex, the sorting tray was just chock-a-block with fish for a one-hour shot. And there was a sea snake in amongst it, and as I was raking the rubbish down, he uh, got me on the little finger. About an hour and a half, I was having breathing problems. Uh, my vision all around the outside was all fuzzy. It was clear in the middle that it was all fuzzy. And back then there was no SE rescue. So we sort of got popping a few Panadols and we sort of waited it out. In their four weeks of studying sea snakes, Sharon can now identify the harmless turtle-headed species and even enjoy its inquisitive nature.
sea snakes have an excellent sense of olfaction. When they extend the tongue, waterborne chemicals dissolve in the membrane. As the tongue retracts, a sensory pit called the Jacobson's organ in the roof of the mouth detects the odours. They can use this acute sense of smell to find a prey or follow a potential mate. They do see well but seem unable to use vision in the recognition of prey. The tongue has another vital purpose. Sea snakes get rid of excess salt with a little gland that's just underneath that tongue. So when you see them poking around out there at the bottom, they're constantly exploring the crevices in the coral with the tongue, picking up uh, scent. But at the same time, they're pushing out salt, getting rid of excess salt using that sublingual salt gland. I'm taking uh, these subcortical scales here as, uh, as tissue samples. Because these days there's a lot of work that's focusing on DNA analysis. You can use um, DNA analysis to look at the relationships uh, between populations of animals. And of course what we've got out here at Marion Reef is a very isolated population of sea snakes. Now, we're about 200 nautical miles offshore. Now these sea snakes don't cover distances like that. All right? So we've got a, a population here that's, that's quite distinct from all the other populations on the uh, closer to the coast. So you'd expect that a population like this one out here, genetically, it could be quite distinct from some of the populations on the mainland, and that's the sort of relationship we'll be looking at. Yeah, she's just here in front of us. She's just up there. Oh, okay. Well, that's great. That's day 12. That's, that's the longest we've ever been able to track a snake for. Oh, that's, really? that's excellent. Uh, but it means that we're going to have to go and get her. After 12 days of tracking, she sheds her skin. She achieves this by rubbing her lips against the coral to loosen the skin and work it free. On the run, the skin slides off, inside out, behind her. She was just shedding her skin. She's just finishing shedding. Oh, truly. Just a bit of her uh, tail skin hanging off the tip there. Good stuff. Glenn needs to retrieve the expensive transmitter. Let's see if we can pinpoint that tag. That's it there. It's right there. So it's here in her stomach forward part of the stomach so now it's just a matter of getting it to regurgitate it. All right. This sort of um, sonic tracking work helps give us an idea of the ecology of these animals. Good. And we've got a really good idea now uh, of the ecology of the olive sea snake, anyway, Apicerus lavis. We've been working on it for a long time now. But all these other ones we've got out here, I mean, what have we seen just in the last few days? We've got um, about seven different species right here. Uh, from four different genera. Things like the olive and the Dubuisai, and they're pretty much generalist feeders. Anything we give them, they'll take. Some of the other species, though, are very specific feeders. They've got their head down goby holes. Basically, they seem to feed almost exclusively on gobies, and when they catch them, they bring them to the surface to swallow them there. Uh, that's the first time I've seen that. So we're building up a picture the whole time on this complex of sea snakes. And obviously these snakes are an important part of the ecology of Marion Reef. The Amitocephalus, they eat um, the fish eggs, right? But we saw that one, it was chomping away on that weed. Yeah, well, I mean, you read the textbooks and uh, Amitocephalus feeds almost exclusively on fish eggs. And yet that one that we saw that we filmed was chewing away on what looked like a lump of algae. Maybe there were some fish eggs in that lump of algae that we couldn't see. This is why I collected some of it. We'll take it back, we'll put it under a dissecting microscope back ashore and, and have a closer look at it. She's throwing up the tag, Ling, look. 
There it is. Oh, wow. Great. Hello, right, Sharon. I'd like to get a link yep. on Gertrude here. A sonic snake. Um, experiment. Yeah. Say 92. Good. 92 snout vent. Oh, she's trying to bite. No, 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 no. Biting's bad, hey? <laughs> 20 millimetres, skull width. Overweight is 900 grams. And now we can let you go. With their unique adaptation to life in the sea and their great diversity in Australian waters, sea snakes are a rich and fascinating part of our natural heritage. Despite their deadly potential, we have seen that they pose only a minimal risk to humans. We can, cautiously, share the waters with them.